Welcome to Introduction to Clinical Psychology. I think you will find this is a course that has a lot of stimulating material, and I suspect many of you are taking it uh, because you anticipate that the, the material that we examine in this course will be relevant to you, and, and we'll certainly try to make it that way. Also, it's important to know that uh, we do not presume that you've had a lot of psychology courses before you take this. Uh, so this is a course that, that, that tries to be self-contained. However, it does mean you need to very seriously pursue the reading that's assigned and watch the lectures so that you do develop some mastery uh, over the complexity of materials that we'll look at. Now, I, I'm Dr. Edward Sheridan, and I'm the instructor for this course. And I am a clinical psychologist. My doctorate is in that field. And I also have what is called a diplomate in clinical health psychology. And a diplomate is a credential that you get after you have a PhD and after you've been in practice for a minimum of three years. And you take a series of exams where you're, you do certain uh, diagnoses and you present a, a treatment case and you're examined on ethics. And, uh, and some clinical psychologists choose to get that additional uh, credential and I happen to be one of those who did that. Now also you're going to see with many of the people that we study in clinical psychology that their, their own lives uh, really factored into how they saw what happened and, and you're going to see that their own lives uh, you know create certain biases. Those biases may not be detrimental but, they, but it's how you look at life. So I thought I should tell you a little bit about my own background. Uh, in the branch of Sheridan's that I come from, I am the first child in the history of my family to be born in the United States. Now, there probably are many of you who, uh, or at least a number of you, who also were the first child to be born in the United States, and many of you uh, were not born in the United States. Uh, but th th those variables can become important. Uh, my father was absolutely convinced, uh, and, I, and all the data I've gathered since then I think it tells me that it's true, that looking back, uh, as my father looked back at his brothers, at his parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, nieces, nephews, uncles, etc., my father was convinced, I, I'm the first child in the history of our family to graduate from grade school. Uh, my parents, who uh, were Irish immigrants, uh, went to fifth grade, they were literate, uh, but they grew up in, in significant poverty. Uh, their homes had no running water, no electricity, uh, no plumbing. They had outhouses. Uh, their homes had dirt floors. So uh, they, they really knew what it was like to suffer. And they came here to, and uh, got married and had my sister, who was younger than me and myself. And they wanted to uh, make life good uh, for us. Now also, the... Uh, in terms of my clinical background, I, the largest part of my clinical background was spent at Northwestern University Medical School in Chicago. And for eight years, I was the chief of psychiatry outpatient services uh, and ran a very large outpatient mental health system, uh, probably the largest in the Midwest. And then I spent nine years as professor and chair in psychology. And during all of that time, I was in private practice also. So my background is such that I saw lots of emotionally troubled people. Uh, I saw people who had significant medical disorders and also had serious emotional problems. And, uh, and then I uh, did a lot of administration in the medical center. So I was seeing a, a wide range of patients uh, in uh, a setting where people who had very significant problems tended to get referred. Now, our course also has a teaching assistant, and that person's very important for you. That person will run a discussion board that will enable you uh, to ask questions, uh, actually ask questions of each other, ask questions of the teaching assistant, uh, and, uh, and you'll find that with the teaching assistant, you'll get answers right away. So we try to be very responsive to uh, what you bring up also, uh, on the WebCT Blackboard, you'll find uh, a lot of information about this course 
that will be very helpful to you. So you want to consult it very regularly. Now to do well in the course, there are a number of things that I want uh, to suggest to you. First of all, you do want to carefully review the syllabus for this course. Uh, it has much information that will assist you and, uh, and often questions you have uh, are already answered there. The syllabus also indicates that I will assume you've read the assigned reading material before you watch the lectures. Uh, obviously, you know, you uh, do these things the way you find best for you, but if you read the material first, uh, you'll find that some of it will create questions for you, and often those questions then get answered in the lectures. So it's an efficient way to go about, uh, you know, preparing for this class. The exams uh, for this class will be a combination of multiple choice and true and false. And, and I do want to assure all of you that the exams will not have trivia. You will not be asked for dates, you'll not be asked for birthplaces, you'll not be asked for minute items. Uh, the idea is that you'll be exposed to uh, lots of information and, uh, and my hope is that uh, you will integrate it very well. Now, some of you may be familiar with, with uh, you know, <coughs> university systems where a lot of emphasis is placed on mastering certain material. And then the exams test you on have you mastered <coughs> the material and the professor may give a lecture just before each exam to kind of integrate all the material. In, in research universities, we don't tend to do that. Uh, what we do is we give you lots of material. Uh, we assume that you are working with it, uh, mastering it as we go along. And the exams really uh, take place to see, have you integrated the material the way we hoped you would? So that's why we, the exams deal with the major concepts and deal with the complexities of the field. Now, there's nothing to keep uh, you as students from getting together in groups uh, and studying for the exams if you feel that would be helpful. And it's certainly common that students in this course do that. And of course, the WebCT Blackboard uh, discussion board is extremely helpful because you can make contact with other people who perhaps live in your vicinity, uh, get together and study together if you want, share materials. But what I do want to say is <coughs> I will not be giving a summary lecture before each exam uh, to tell you what's important. There are ways, though, for you certainly to determine uh, what I think you know, is important. You know, for example, if the book devotes a significant space to something and then I lecture on it and if, in addition, I think it's important enough that I make a slide about it, you can figure that's probably on the exam. So. Uh, you should get a very good idea about what's on the exam. And as I've uh, emphasized, we're not going to put trivia uh, you know, on the exam. You do want to know that I will uh, put on the exam information that you may find only in these lectures. And you also may find things on the exam where uh, the topic is dealt with, I think, quite well in the textbook, so I didn't bother to lecture on it. So it, you want to be aware that you do need to know what your textbook is, uh, has to say. You do want to observe the lectures, and that's all material that can be on the exam. Also, uh, early in this course, we'll talk about uh, national conferences in psychology. And, and they're, they're very important for the history of this field. But, you know, when you talk about national conferences, they know the material tends to be dry. So uh, don't get discouraged because uh, you know, some of the early material is dry. It's necessary that we do that in order for you to have a foundation uh, to understand what this field is about. But we'll, you'll find it's more interesting when we get to things like theories of personality, uh, psychopathology, abnormal psychology, uh, diagnosis, treatment, health psychology. You'll find all of that material probably much more interesting than hearing about national conferences. Also, I want to emphasize that you should feel uh, very free 
uh, to raise questions either with myself or the teaching assistant. Uh, if things aren't clear, you know, ask about them. If the syllabus is not clear, ask about it. If a lecture is not clear, uh, contact us and tell us what the problem is. But uh, you know, our goal is to be as responsive to you as we possibly can. Through this course, there are a number of concepts that uh, I will talk about. And I thought I might start by defining some of them for you so you will be familiar uh, when these uh, you know, concepts jump up in the class and when I make references to certain kinds of behavior. So if you look at the very first slide uh, that we have, uh, there's a term called psychosis. And psychosis refers to severe emotional disorders, say like <coughs> schizophrenia <coughs> or bipolar disorders, which uh, often are, re are called manic depressive disorders. <coughs> it even refers to some uh, brain syndromes. But psychosis <coughs> is a reference to the most serious mental disorders. And so when we're talking about them, uh, you want to be aware we're talking about something that is very debilitating, uh, very challenging, and we are still learning a great deal about psychoses. Now then <coughs> there's the word psychotic. And psychotic refers to extreme symptoms, say like hallucinations or delusions or the inability to appreciate uh, reality <coughs> or, <coughs> excuse me, or extreme states uh, like uh, anxiety or depression, uh, you know, where people are almost out of control with anxiety or people are terribly depressed thinking of ending their life. And, and also, uh, some people show uh, these symptoms just from taking street drugs. So it's not necessary that someone have one of the very serious mental illnesses that we call psychoses in order to be psychotic. Uh, psychotic, we tend to think of as a, as a briefer life experience and filled with these symptoms where uh, someone is either hearing voices or seeing visions or they're living in a delusional world. They, they think they're God or something like that. Uh, and, uh, and when the person, uh, when those symptoms lessen, it doesn't mean that they're not psychotic. Excuse me, it doesn't mean they don't have a psychosis, but it means they're no longer psychotic. They're not in these acute states. Uh, it's even truer for people who experience uh, uh, psychotic episodes when they're on drugs. When the drugs uh, kind of get out of their system, they no longer have these serious symptoms. Now, there also uh, are sources <clears throat> for problems. And as we go along, you'll find that how different theorists think about problems uh, changes fairly dramatically. Like <clears throat> when we study, <clears throat> excuse me, when we study psychoanalysis and Freud, psychoanalysis makes the assumption that personal problems occur because one has irrational uh, impulses that are seeking gratification. That is, the irrational behavior is uh, caused by feelings inside yourself, very disruptive feelings that are trying to express themselves and they do so in uh, a chaotic way and that's why people's behavior, uh, be behaviors become abnormal. Now, when you look at this from the client-centered therapy approach, you get a, a very different uh, view. Uh, here, the assumption uh, is that the reason that people are behaving abnormally is because they have significant interpersonal problems. And it's the relationships they've had in their life, uh, and, and in some cases, uh, some things that they've learned incorrectly that cause people to behave abnormally. So there's quite a distinction to be made between the psychoanalytic view of abnormal behavior and the client-centered view. Then there's the view from cognitive behavioral therapy. And this makes an assumption that most personal problems come from faulty learning. It's a, a very different approach. 
And historically, psychoanalysis had a, a profound impact on the way we look uh, at psychopathology, abnormal behavior, how we look at systems of treatment. Uh, but today, cognitive behavioral therapy is much more the approach, especially used in psychology, and it's the approach that certainly is, is, has the most research that's ongoing right now. Now, we're going to discuss uh, what is clinical psychology. And probably, you know, as students, all of you have some idea about what it is. Uh, but you'll find that as we go along, probably I'm going to introduce a number of variables that you had not considered before. For example, the, the history of the field is only a little over 100 years. But the clinical psychology that is of interest to students today uh, actually has only been in existence for maybe 50 to 60 years. So uh, there's, you know, it's, in terms of disciplines, it's really quite a new discipline. Also, in, in the past 50 years, the American Psychological Association, which is the largest psychological association in the world, it has like about 155,000 members. It has found it necessary to develop divisions because there are so many interest groups. And in fact, the American Psychological Association has between 50 and 60 divisions. And you'll see here, it took me two slides to just be able to show you, uh, you know, the subsections. First of all, Division 12, uh, and, and these are all numbered within APA, but Division 12 is the Division of Clinical Psychology. It's very large. And, but uh, there are many other groups that do clinical uh, work or are interested in clinical phenomena that have gotten together to focus on their interest. So you notice there's consulting psychology, there's school psychology, there's counseling psychology, there's rehabilitation psychology, a, a newer uh, or at least very exciting field that's been getting a lot of attention recently. Uh, there's behavior analysis, which is very related to cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, you'll see there's psychotherapy, there's hypnosis, there's health psychology. And as we go on, you'll see there's a division of psychoanalysis that's very focused on that issue. Clinical neuropsychology is a dramatically different uh, division than psychoanalysis. I mean, it's a division that really is extremely interested in brain function and behavior that comes from brain function and how you help people who have brain injuries recover. Division 42, which is psychologists in independent practice, <coughs> is actually the largest division uh, within the American Psychological Association. And it really represents where psychologists are today, and that is most psychologists, even if they work in mental health centers, or they work in medical schools, or they work in universities, also have some kind of private practice. And, and then you can see there's family psychology, and there's group psychology, and there's addictions, and there's pediatric psychology, which, as you can see, is different than clinical child psychology. Uh, and then there's uh, psychologists that become very involved in, with excuse me, psychopharmacology, and so there's a division for that. And this isn't all the divisions. So what you want to be aware of is this is a, uh, clinical psychology is, is a huge, broad field with people having interests in many, many different phases, and we're going to try to, to study these things. Now, as I mentioned, you know, clinical psychology also in itself is a subdivision of the larger world of psychology. And, but in terms of members of the American Psychological Association, clinical psychology is obviously the one that has the most interest. And over time, there have been, you know, some fascinating things that have happened uh, with this field. People get doctorates in various areas. Uh, if you go back, for instance, I'll show you on this last slide. If you notice, Division 12 is clinical psychology. Division 16 is school psychology. Division 17 is counseling psychology. Now, 
those uh, people who get degrees in those fields do study somewhat different things. But they study an awful lot of things in common. And particularly in the case of clinical and counseling psychology, once people get their degrees and they go into practice, it is not uncommon that they go into the same kinds of worlds. That is, you can find both clinical and counseling psychologists working in mental health centers, working in university counseling centers, uh, being in private practice, uh, treating people in medical schools or hospitals. So that while the training may be somewhat different, and we'll go extensively into training, but, uh, but it's strange that later on in careers, you, you really can't tell whether someone's background is in clinical or counseling. And many people in school do things like this too. They don't necessarily go and work in schools. They may end up working uh, in mental health centers. Now, when you contrast clinical psychologists uh, with other providers of mental health services, say like social workers, psychiatrists, uh, nurses, family therapists, there are three distinguishing characteristics that you would want to know about psychologists. First, psychology is the only one of those that has its own basic science. That is, we have personality theory, uh, and we certainly try to study personality theory, very science, we have, we have the psychology of personality, I should say, and we try to study it very scientifically. Uh, other fields are dependent on psychology for uh, the study of personality and for what emanates from it because many of our theories and our studies on abnormal behavior stem from our understanding of psychology, as do many of the studies we've done on psychological interventions or psychotherapy. So the scientific base uh, in psych, or I should say the theoretical base, the basic science in psychology distinguishes it. Second, clinical psychologists conduct research on a broad range of problems. And it's the one discipline that is really focused on training people both as clinicians and as scientists. And, and that is something that psychology has tried to and, and has maintained for a long time, that even though you're going to practice in the mental health world, uh, the, the reality is you want to think as a scientist. And then the third variable is that psychologists have developed an extraordinary number of tests. And when we find that we uh, can't learn enough from a person by interviewing them or observing them, we have a number of tests that we give that really are very helpful in giving us information that we can't get any other way. Now, there, there are psychologists who engage uh, solely in research, but that is, that is not a large percentage of the field. The largest percentage of the field by far are psychologists who engage in psychological intervention. That's what's created the majority uh, of excitement in the field. And, and it's interesting, in university doctoral programs, often the faculty want the students to become researchers. Uh, and students are real bright, so they all say that they want to become researchers. <clears throat> but the reality is, if you look at what happens when people finish their doctorates, the vast majority go into some kind of practice world. Now, you also will see that a majority, that is more than 50% of psychologists who get doctorates in a discipline where science is emphasized as much as practice, these psychologists do not publish even one study after they finish their doctorate. That is, the average psychologist has zero publications. And so you might wonder, well, if they have zero publications, uh, you know, are they really interested in research? Uh, the truth is, psychologists are. Uh, and most people will tell you, even though they may be in a 100% clinical job, and they may not be doing research, that they're very appreciative of the fact 
that they were trained as scientists because it causes them to look at human problems, at psychopathology, at ways to intervene uh, in various disorders in a different way because they're always looking for evidence that what they're doing is the best way to do it. And, uh, and so people like their science background and when we study this from time to time uh, at some of these national conferences we'll talk about, we always seem to come back to saying, you really have to have all this science training. And, uh, and that's why we, we also uh, talk about psychologists, the most common model, there are, we'll talk about a number of models, but the most common model is called scientist-practitioner, uh, meaning that you should give equal weight to teaching somebody about science as well as teaching them how to practice. Uh, other disciplines do not do that. Now, in terms of a definition of clinical psychology, to give you uh, something that you might work with, you'll see that in, in this slide that I've just put up, in terms of definitions, uh, clinical psychology, this definition, by the way, of clinical psychology was uh, adopted in 1991 by APA's Division uh, of Clinical Psychology. And as you can see, it states, the field of clinical psychology involves research, teaching, and services relevant to the applications of principles, methods, and procedures for understanding, predicting, and alleviating intellectual, emotional, biological, psychological, social and behavioral maladjustment, disability, and discomfort applied to a wide range of populations. Now, when you look at that definition, you think, how did they come up with all those variables? Well, actually, the definition is, is, a, is a rather good one uh, because the field of clinical psychology is that complex. But you can also see that a definition like this was made up by a committee and everybody wanted to get in uh, those things that they felt were important to the field. So you get a pretty complex definition. But I would tell you, uh, you know, if you give yourself a little time to reflect on this definition, you will end up saying, you know, that this actually is a good definition of psychology. Now we are going uh, to spend considerable time discussing the activities uh, in which psychologists engage. However, I want to give you a brief overview of what these areas are, and then we'll discuss them more in depth as we go along. And you'll see on, on this slide that I've listed six areas, uh, and there are six broad areas in which clinical psychologists engage. There is assessment, treatment, research, teaching, consultation, and administration. Some people in their careers, by the way, engage in all of these. Others do not. And the, there's no question, as I've said a couple of times already, though, while uh, people may engage in these various activities, the majority of people spend a majority of their career being involved uh, and engaged in the treatment of various disorders. Let's look now, then, at the, the first uh, assessment. And the question is, how do psychologists assess people? And they do so either by interviewing them. By far, the most common way to assess someone is you sit down, you talk with them, you ask them a lot of questions, you learn a lot about them, uh, and you develop some understanding of why they have a problem. Uh, or you give them tests. Uh, often when interviewing is not successful, someone feels, I really don't understand why this person is the way he or she is. Tests can reveal a lot of information that wasn't evident uh, in an interview. Or we, we make observations about how people interact uh, and what kind of behavior they show uh, in an interview situation. Uh, or in a group dynamic setting. So we start off, and the typical way to appreciate abnormal behavior is you interview someone. 
uh, tests come second, observations come, become part of what you do either when you're interviewing or when you're testing someone. Now, what are these observations? Well, if a person walks into your office and the person is very fidgety and is, is showing a lot of signs, almost shaking, and they don't make eye contact with you and they're looking all over the place, uh, you know, you learn a lot right away. I mean, a person been in your office one minute. You know this person is highly anxious. You know this person probably is not a very effective individual interpersonally. Uh, you know that uh, it's not easy for them to meet a new person. Uh, they can't even make eye contact with you. So you realize that in starting off with this person, uh, you want to be very gentle. Uh, you're going to have to create a safe environment if you're going to learn things from the person. Now you also have people you know, come into your office and in, in the first minute, the person will do something like say, you know, I don't like that painting you have on the wall. And uh, boy, you know, this chair is uncomfortable. And I don't like the color of these walls. I mean, the walls may be white, uh, but it wouldn't matter. Uh, what you find is you're sitting with a person who's been in your office 60 seconds, and they're already criticizing everything. So what are you learning? Well, you're learning, first of all, that this is a very anxious situation for this person. You're learning the person handles anxiety by being hostile and distancing. I mean, here he or she is in your office. They've just got there, <coughs> and already they're distancing themselves from you. And so what you know is when they get anxious in an interpersonal situation, rather than, let's say, be reflective or ask themselves, I mean, why is it that I feel the way I feel? Uh, they, they become hostile as a way of protecting themselves. And, and so when you see that happen and you make those, that kind of an observation, you recognize I'm dealing with somebody who is not interpersonally effective and I want to take uh, some time. Now, there are other kind of observations you make, and I was thinking about one where a, a woman phoned me and made an appointment. And so I went out into the waiting room uh, to meet her, and I went out and introduced myself, and she introduced herself, a very nice person, and, she, uh, and we shook hands. And I noticed that she had a, a very large hand, and that caused me to look closer at her. And suddenly I said to myself, you know, obviously this person is a transsexual. Now, we came into the office and we sat down. The woman didn't tell me she was a transsexual until our third session. And because I had recognized this just from the way we interacted in the waiting room, I avoided asking her certain questions, especially intimate questions about her background, because I felt she wasn't ready yet to talk about those things. And it becomes very important for clinicians to be able to make these kinds of observations, uh, to learn from patients from things other than what they say, and then to use that information to try to create a, a safe and caring environment so the person can talk about what they would really like to talk about. Now, the next thing we have is treatment. And as I've been telling you, you know, this is the major activity that most psychologists engage in. And, and actually, the opportunity to do treatment is what attracts an awful lot of people to the field. And, and it, it's a broad concept. Uh, it can refer uh, to people, uh, to working with people who have emotional problems. And those emotional problems can have a wide spectrum. It can be you know, people who have some kind of adjustment problem, they're not doing well in school, or they're phobic for giving talks. Or it can refer to people with very serious disorders like schizophrenia, where uh, a great deal of effort has to be put into working with the person, and a lot of careful relating has to be done. Uh, but there are many other uh, things we treat people for. Uh, we treat developmentally challenged people. Uh, people with low IQs. And, uh, and again, you know, psychologists develop programs uh, if, they're, if they get these people early enough in life where they first of all diagnose what is the issue and then they develop treatment. Now if that doesn't happen and people get to be adults, often you can't separate people who've had serious emotional problems from people who are cognitively slower. I remember a friend of mine started a center 
for uh, essentially uh, intellectually challenged adults. And she was telling me that in the center, she decided to start a group therapy program. And so she brings in, and there's a, about 10 of the patients for her first group. And immediately, one person says to her, aren't you going to tape this session? And she said, well, why would you think we would tape this session? And, and the patient says, well, you know, in group therapy, therapists tend to tape sessions. I've seen this on TV, and, uh, and I've seen this. I was in a group before, and they taped it. And another patient jumps in and says, yes, you know, I always thought in group therapy, we taped the sessions. Well, she was telling me after this that, you know, she realized immediately, these people are not intellectually uh, retarded or impaired. Uh, these are people who probably, when they were young, uh, were psychotic, uh, had some kind of psychosis, and their behavior was bizarre. And somebody decided that they probably were retarded or intellectually challenged. So they, they put them in uh, schools for the intellectually challenged, and these people were always around intellectually challenged people. They got identified that way. Now here they are, you know, 20 years old, uh, and this is the way they've been reinforced their whole life. And, and psychologists working in these fields sometimes begin to realize, you know, we could help this person to do a lot more if we could just change the perception uh, of the person. Now we also work with people who are dealing with a very specific problem. Let's say, uh, like smoking. And there's treatments that we have developed that uh, focus specifically on taking a single behavior and then trying to help a person to overcome it. Psychologists also work with people who have uh, physical disorders. Uh, say, you know, burn victims or, or people who have headaches. There are very specific treatments that are helpful to people who have had headaches. And there certainly are treatments that are helpful to people who have had real traumas in life, uh, like being the victim of burns. And then a big field, of course, is, is working with individuals who have marital disorders and, uh, or, you know, just interpersonal disorders in general. But marital therapy, family therapy, very big fields in psychology today. And psychologists also help to diagnose physical disorders. You know, the, the stereotype is a physician examines someone and, and finds, you know, there's just no cause for this problem. So they send the person to a psychologist saying, uh, you know, whatever is troubling this person, uh, it's certainly not uh, something that's physical. Now, I, I remember a patient was referred to me in, in that setting, and the uh, physician doing the referral said to me, we've examined this person very thoroughly. Uh, he has an unusual symptom. He, he claims he has pain in his neck, but uh, you know we've done all kinds of x-rays and exams and, and there's nothing there and we can't account for why he has this pain. So I evaluated the person and I thought I did a fairly uh, you know, extensive evaluation. And I came back to the internist and I said to her, I have to tell you, this man actually has, there is a physical cause for this man's neck pain. There is no way you can account for this man's pain in psychological terms. So she said, well, she says, you know, Ed, I'm, I'm really sorry to hear this in a way, but I'll go back and look at his chart. So she goes back and looks at his chart. And, and I, I run into her a week later, and she says, you know what I found when I went back to see that patient's material? We didn't do such a good job with the x-rays. And in fact, uh, we redid the x-rays, and we found, indeed, there is a very serious lesion uh, in this man's neck. Uh, and in fact, he really is in stage four uh, cancer. And unfortunately, the man died shortly after. But psychologists do not necessarily decide if uh, you can't find a physical cause for something, there is no physical cause. Uh, if you can't find a psychological cause, uh, you have to begin to look that something may have been overlooked physically. Psychologists also, uh, clinical psychologists historically, dealt with organizations. And they dealt with such things uh, as communication problems, stress, 
uh, motivational issues, and, uh, and still many people do consult uh, to big corporations. But a subfield has developed uh, in the world of psychology today called industrial organizational psychology. And the psychologists who are in that field uh, are trained very specifically to work with companies uh, and organizations. And so that field has kind of moved away from clinical psychology. Uh, it's a very sophisticated world, and, and it's not one that, that we'll be discussing. In conducting treatment, psychologists most often will see someone one-to-one. -one. That is, that, that's, you know, one psychologist seeing one person is most common. But it's not the only thing. Uh, it's not unusual, for example, in marital therapy, you may have a male and a female therapist uh, seeing a couple. Or you may have more than one therapist uh, seeing a family. And psychologists also conduct, conduct treatment with groups. And, uh, and they, they may conduct treatment with a group of, of anonymous individuals who are dealing with certain emotional problems. By anonymous individuals, by the way, what I simply mean is the people in the group have not met each other previously. And they're coming together now because there's, uh, they have been, let's say, ineffectual uh, interpersonally. And so they're going to find out by relating to the members of the group, what is it that keeps them from being successful? Uh, you also may have a group uh, of anonymous people again, but they're going to, they're in a group to deal with a target symptom. Uh, a common one might be gambling. And groups are formed where the focus is specifically on why is this person a compulsive gambler? Uh, what can be done to help the person to get over that? And, uh, and often these groups become very challenging. That is, uh, you know, it, it's hard to lie to a fellow gambler because people are so aware of what motivates them and often it's, uh, it's more effective to have a group of people with this problem confronting each other than to try to do it in one-to-one -one therapy. We've, we learned that, by the way, a long time ago uh, with people who have drug problems. Uh, you know, historically, everybody in, in, in my field knows if you're talking to somebody who has a drug problem, uh, they're gonna lie to you a lot. Put them in a group. When they begin to lie, the other addicts pick up right away and become very confronting of them and so you get down to more basic things faster in a group than you would working with someone one-to-one. -one. Also, psychologists may work with, with groups of people, actually very healthy people, uh, but they need to get organized around a target. Uh, you know, for example, if you had, say, a, a group of Navy SEALs that are about to go off on a mission, often it's very helpful for them to be in a group where uh, issues get discussed. One listens very carefully to see are there any fears that people have that need to be examined? And is everybody really listening to each other? In the groups that I mentioned too, while there may be more than one therapist, the most common uh, situation is that there is one therapist. Also in terms of structure, the most common amount of time spent uh, like in one-to-one -one therapy, is 45 or 50 minutes. You need about that much time, uh, although with the current mental health system being what it is in the United States, there's more and more pressure to see people for shorter sessions and to see them for a shorter number of sessions. And we'll talk about that at much greater length, but that's a very serious problem. And the problem is that some of our interventions do not work well when you don't get people for a longer period of time, uh, even in one session, and certainly don't work well if you have to limit the sessions. I can, in fact, tell you a personal example. This, this is an utterly bizarre example, but it's true. Uh, I once I had a patient referred to me who was suicidal, and, and the person was quite suicidal, but I thought the person could be treated in an outpatient setting. And, uh, and it was just at the time that managed care was becoming very popular. And so this person had insurance, so he had to call the managed care company to get permission for a certain number of sessions. 
and I call and I explain that this person is seriously suicidal. And the person on the other end of the line, who I suspect uh, had a degree perhaps in business administration or finance or something, uh, says, I'll authorize two sessions. I said, I just told you, this person is seriously suicidal. He said, well, you know, if he doesn't get better after two sessions, you can call me back and ask for more sessions. So, uh, you know, there have been things that, you know, pressures in the mental health world that have come in that are absolutely bizarre. And, and, and pressures to change something in a way that will not work. But we do deal with that today. Now, in group uh, interventions, usually the length of time is like 90 minutes to two hours. Historically, uh, we have had groups that went much longer sessions. In fact, there was a theory once uh, that got proposed that people in groups may be able to be defensive and kind of hide for 90 minutes or a couple of hours. But if you see them for a much longer time, they'll really disclose and you know, what their real problems are, and it'll be much easier to work with them. And so groups were designed that even went as long as 24 hours. Marathon groups, they called them. And, uh, and so uh, this was tested, it was researched. We actually found it probably wasn't true that you get all that much more by keeping people in groups for long periods of time. It's much better to see them several times uh, in a shorter term group. And also it's very difficult for the patients to get 24 hours, difficult to get a therapist for 24 hours. And then if the therapists are charging by the hour, very difficult for patients to afford it. Uh, so that never went really anywhere, and we're back to where groups usually run about 90 minutes to two hours. Also, interventions may run anywhere from one session uh, to many, many sessions. I recall uh, seeing a patient one time who was referred to me uh, by the chairman in medicine. The chairman in medicine was a man who was really world famous for treating people with asthma. And he had this patient who he had on very large doses of a drug called prednisone. And the patient was afraid to take these large dosages. And, and the reason he was afraid was because he had a cousin who was a physician and he told his cousin that this, uh, that this uh, chairman had prescribed these very large dosages and the cousin had said, that's too much, you shouldn't take that much. So the patient started taking none or much less and he wasn't getting any better. So I get the patient. And I already knew all these factors. The chairman had explained to me that uh, for this man's disorder, if he doesn't take the high dosages, he, he is not going to survive. Man comes in, I recognize right away that this man is a you know, reasonably well put together guy, successful in business. And uh, we get talking and I ask him, uh, you know, do you know who referred you? He says, yeah, the chairman of medicine referred me. I said, do you know that he is uh, the world's probably foremost authority on your problem? He says, yeah, you know, I had heard that. I said, if you're seeing the best person probably available to you for this problem, why do you think he referred, him, he referred you to me? I mean, you know who I am. He says, yeah, you're the chairman in psychology. I said, doesn't that seem strange to you? He says, well, you know, my physician is worried because I'm not taking this medication uh, the way I should. So after I talk with him about his family and get some sense about what the structure is like in his life, I said to him, you realize that you and I only have two things to talk about. And he says, what's that? I said, you can either take the medication that's being prescribed by a world-class physician who very seriously believes that you have to take this much prednisone or you will not get better. Or our other option is we can talk about you dying because that's what's gonna happen. You're either gonna to decide to take the medication or you're gonna die. Well, the man was stunned, but he was very bright and he began realizing, you know, this is true. This is what his physician has been telling him. So we talked more about it, and I said, you know, I don't, I don't think you want to die. He says, no, I don't. And I says, you know, you have an awfully good person telling you what you should do, so maybe you want to think about that. Well, he goes off, and I, and I told him, by the way, leaving, uh, that uh, he should 
come back in one week. But if he left my office, I said, and you start taking the medication the, at the way you should, and you are taking it that way a week from now, you can cancel our appointment. A week later, I run into the chairman in medicine. He says, what'd you do to that patient? And I say, well, you know, I told him he should take the medication the way you prescribed it. He says, but I told him that. And, I, and he says, what, what's really bugging me, he says, you know, the guy loves you. He thinks you're terrific. And he, by the way, he's taking the medication exactly the way he should. And he's much healthier. He's had the best test results since I've been seeing him. And he says, but I can't understand why he did it when he saw you once. And he wouldn't do it when he saw me all these times. Well, as you can imagine, in my case, I just had one task with this person. And that was to try to understand him, to make him feel safe, and to get him to do something that he really needed to do for his life. When you're a very, very busy uh, asthma specialist, like the chairman of medicine was, patients are coming in, there's constant pressure. Uh, you don't have the time to sit down and talk with people uh, as much time as you would like. Uh, because the, the waiting room is filled, everybody wants you to see their worst case. And so, uh, you know, after I talked with the chairman, we both agreed that uh, it probably made a huge difference that he made that referral to me and that someone really sat down and talked with him uh, about this problem. Now, there are people I have also seen, in fact, uh, and psychologists have, for several years of treatment. And, and people do change. I mean, sometimes people need an awful lot of time uh, to change. But when you look at where they were when they first came in, and then you look at what's happened to them, uh, you find that people's lives change significantly, and people are very appreciative uh, of it. Also, there's, there are uh, interventions, even one-to-one -one interventions, where uh, there's a specific number of sessions. Uh, you may see someone like the specific problem, maybe they have an eating disorder, and there's a, a, a protocol for working with that person, and you, it's predetermined. You're going to see them X number of sessions, you're going to try to cover certain materials, and often those interventions are very successful. Now, while intervention uh, in existing problems uh, is important and, and takes up most of the time of psychologists, there are psychologists who work in prevention, and, and prevention programs can be terribly important, although our society uh, doesn't want to, to pay for them. Uh, one of the you know, most interesting ones occurred in the early 1980s when we discovered this HIV virus, which caused people to get AIDS. Uh, you know, early in the AIDS treatment, if you don't know this, uh, we only had two tests that uh, medicine could use to diagnose if someone was HIV positive. And then we only had one drug to treat a person with, and that drug was never used until someone had a very low T cell count. So we began realizing that if we are going to, uh, to deal with the HIV virus, we've got to teach people how not to get it. And so psychologists became involved in uh, and working with school systems to educate people. Actually in Chicago, where I was, uh, the AIDS Center at Northwestern actually developed the first curriculum. And they actually taught kids from kindergarten through grade 12. And they geared the curriculum to teaching children uh, what they could learn appropriately at that age, but kind of trying to move them along. After they developed the whole curriculum, by the way, uh, the public school system in Chicago refused to, to put it in. But the Catholic Archbishop of Chicago thought it was a very good idea. So the curriculum actually started out uh, in the Catholic school system in Chicago, not a place that people thought uh, would be the first place for it. And uh, also, there were other programs for prevention that got started. Uh, one was, uh, you know, the idea of giving out condoms. I mean, we knew that there really are two things you have to teach people if they're going to avoid becoming HIV positive. One is don't be sexually active with a lot of strangers. And the second was, if you're going to be sexually active with a number of people, use condoms. And free condoms were given out as a way to encourage people to use them 
because it was so dangerous to be sexual uh, and, uh, and not be protected. And, and that was very uh, effective. Now the other way that people you know, got uh, AIDS in those days was from, from dirty needles. That is, one drug addict uh, you know, injects himself or herself with the drug, and then they hand the needle to their partner, uh, and if the first person is HIV positive, and there's some blood on this needle, and they hand it to somebody who then injects themselves with that same needle, uh, and the blood has entered their bloodstream, we now have two people who are HIV positive. So we began the program uh, of needle, free needles for people. And, and lots of politicians thought this was outrageous, that we would give free needles uh, to people. But the reality was it was the only way to prevent the problem. And, and, and there's not a lot uh, of prevention, but there, there is uh, enough prevention that goes on uh, that you know we need to explore it. And in our very next uh, session, I'm going to talk a bit about how we taught uh, large groups of people uh, to engage in prevention and how effective that was. But for today, we'll stop.